it was very funny how that break happened just then because I had one more slide to go through it would have been like two minutes and then before we started tables and figures we were going to have a break so it was actually at a very good time but content wise it leaves me with content wise the timing of the break leaves me with one more slide that I wanted to do before we had a halfway break in this presentation. This is a long presentation, but I told you it's the detailed design. In architectural terms, it's the working drawings from which a house can be built. The others that will come afterwards, the final two, are not as long as this, but not as short as the first one. So let's just quickly talk about this. The previous, presence of the previous slide, I said to you, Every chapter has a chapter in, oh no, you know, I didn't do this one either. Every chapter has a chapter introduction which tells you what to expect. In that chapter introduction, you need to talk about the content in general, but it also helps to add some signposting like section 2.2 outlines that, while section 2.3 addresses that, or in section 4 and 5 the concepts of that and that are respectively introduced. Now that's the way it always was when I started academic writing. But now we use shortcuts, which are very handy, especially when you're writing a journal article and you've got a limit of 5,000 words. Because what I, look, those ways of saying what's there are made interesting by using different words. Section 2.2 outlines while section 2.3 addresses and then I turned it around and I put the sections up front. In sections 4 and 5 the concepts of blah and blow are respectively introduced. I use different words but quite honestly the modern way is much neater. Look at this. Look at bullet one, two, three, four, five. It can be done concisely with parentheses, e.g. XXYYY is overviewed, section three, while KKKs are listed, section four. You must agree, we've still got the different verbs, overviewed and listed, but we don't put in all the infrastructure that says in, we just put it in brackets. But maybe, you can be very sharp and just tell me why in bullet 3 I spoke about section 2.2 and in the other bullets I spoke about a section with a number. Where do you think the second bullet would have come from? What sort of writing? Section 2.2 and section 2.3. That looks like a chapter, so what would that have come out of? Sorry? That comes out of your dissertation because every chapter has got, chapter 2 has got sections 2.1 through to 2.10, whatever. Chapter 5 has got sections 5.1 through to 5.5 and so on. But when you're only writing one document, then we do what I have got in bullet 3 and the last bullet, bullet 4 and the last bullet where I have the second class where I talk about a section. Now that will happen if you are writing a journal article or a conference paper, but it will probably also happen now in your proposal because usually a proposal is just one document. I know of a few cases where people said, you know, but look, it's quite long. You allow me, and I don't know what TUT allows you. I'm sure you've already been having talks on proposals. But usually a proposal is like, a proposal for a dissertation is like 25 to, 30 to 50 pages. And so sometimes people say, can't we write it with many chapters? Okay, so if you have many chapters, then you use the notation of section 2.2, section 5.1, etc. But if it's one single document, if it's just your proposal, with sections. Then you will have section one introduction, section two context, section three of the search design, section four 
data, to, data collection and sampling methods, etc. Get the idea. If it's one document, it has sections. Section one, two, three, four, whatever. If it is a document with chapters, then every chapter has its own sections. All depends on the way you're doing it. Do you know yet what your proposal will be? Is it allowed to have little chapters or is it one document? Does anybody know? You haven't got there yet. You'll be there in a few months, and then you'll find out. All right, but you see what I'm saying. If it's one document, you will give it sections, and the sections can, have sub can also have subsections. So it's just a matter of notation. And then there are nice different words to say what you're doing. It outlines, it addresses, introduced, overviewed, listed. Nice, eh? Five different words so that you don't say... Section 2.1 considers this and section 2.2 considers that and section 2.3 considers that. Let's have some variety. It's not a rule, it's not a pass or fail, but a lot of what I want to tell you about today is just writing something that reads nicely, that a person joys. They don't sort of, they don't even realise it, but it's kind of subconscious that if you have indicates, 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 it kind of hits you. So I want you to write lacquer. Nice flowing things, okay? Um, I did say earlier, journals do have a problem, they can't have hierarchical numbering. Some journals do, but other journals, every heading is in words. And then you have a certain kind of word to do the main topic of a section and then a different font for doing the subsections. That's all for the future, but I'm preparing you. Don't say when you hit a journal, you never knew. You are already being trained. How's that? I said every chapter has a chapter introduction. That's what we dealt with there. Now I'm going to tell you, every chapter's got a chapter conclusion. That chapter conclusion does two things. Number one, it's a little summary. It tells you what you addressed and what you overviewed, all these wonderful words again, very briefly. But the other thing that it should do is give important interpretations. So if there is an aha moment in that chapter, you need to talk about it. In other words, what's like the take-home lesson of that chapter? What was the main thing that you found in your literature study that lays the foundation for what you do? Or in your findings, what was wow? So you could say of particular interest is the fact that whatever. Or if you're testing your prototype, prototype one was far superior to prototype to indicating that the use of the wah 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 technology is more effective, this sort of thing. So your chapter conclusion, brief summary, what was wow, and then bullet two, how does it relate to upcoming chapters? So if it's the research design, that's a really easy one, because you will then say the next chapter on data collection applies these methods in presenting the data, that sort of thing. So you just write a simple sentence, the short bullet number two, just say how it relates to upcoming chapters. Not a speech, just a sentence. An article only has one conclusion. Your dissertation will have conclusions to each chapter. Your article will not conclude each section, although you might have a wrap-up sentence. Nobody's saying don't do that, but you'll only have one actual heading conclusion. Then there's discussion. I recently came across something very interesting. Somebody I know, actually a family member who was writing a master's dissertation, and their supervisor said, I want all the discussion in the conclusion chapter, which actually meant that this person had to go to the results chapter where they had discussed, you know, here are the results discussed, here are the results and they discussed. They actually had to take it all out and put it in the conclusion. So that is one viewpoint. I don't think it's a general viewpoint. Personally, I like discussion in context. So either as you present each finding or each section on the literature, you just write a little bit discussing it, or otherwise you could even, after your data analysis, you could even have a section in which you discuss what you found. But the, as I've told you, there is now this third a, a, a thi um, method that I've come across, and that is where the discussion all took place in the conclusion. I agree. Reflection 
and, ma and many discussion must be in the conclusion because you need to talk about what you found and what it means and perhaps what could have been done differently and so on. So indeed, the conclusion has a certain amount of discussion, but when it comes to the fine-grained discussion, I prefer it done in context. Oh yes, in the conclusion, please don't bring in new facts. Everything that's in the conclusion must be things that have been discussed before. There's only perhaps one new thing you could bring into a conclusion, and that's if you want to put in a nice quotation. Okay, this is where I had planned to start after the break because we're going to talk about tables and figures. Well, you know that a table is a lovely way of presenting stuff. It certainly is fabulous for presenting data, but it can also be quite nice for presenting your literature study. Not your whole study, but certain things. And I told you a story about my supervisor telling me to take that long thing out of chapter one and put it in chapter two, and which is exactly what I did and didn't leave the appropriate mention behind in chapter one. But so many lessons I've learned, life lessons, are from my supervisor, and you're going to learn from your supervisor too. What your very close relationship with that person is really going to carry you through quite a lot in your academic career. Anyway, he looked at my literature study and he said, this is really good. But he said, you know, it does ramble on and on. Nobody's going to look at it. You're going to bore them. Now, I told you that when you have that feeling, one way of solving it is putting in little headings, little subheadings that just, just words. You know, without a number, the, a little word in bold or, or bold italics. But anyway, he said to me, but just look at this. Look at the harmony in it. It really lends itself to a table. So you tabulate this, which indeed I did. It took a lot of time, but I made a beautiful table with all the right headings, you know, saying what, the, what I found and what the um, reference of it was and what the implications were for my study. And I took it very proudly back to him. And he said, yes, this is a wonderful table. My supervisor is a funny guy. He's a very well-known guy. He's very much loved and he it can be very funny. But he said, nobody's going to read it. Okay, so after I'd fallen through the floor, I said, but you told me nobody was going to read my long thing because it was rambling. Yes, he said, that's true. And this is a fantastic table. But do you know that if you just put it in there and you say table 2.1 addresses whatever, they're not going to read it. You've got to take them into it. Now, don't do what some people do. They do a table or a graph, and then after that they write half a page repeating everything that's in it, but in words. What he said to me, and I carry it through my life, and I've spread it to many, by now it must be hundreds of people, because I don't have hundreds of students, but I've probably addressed hundreds of people in workshops. Just make, force them to look at it. So in other words, you look at your table of data and what is interesting, which row or column is different from the rest, and you talk about that. So you will say, the results shown in row 4 which relate to suburban Pretoria are different from the others in this way because that and that. And just by doing that, you force them to look at, try to find two things you force them to look at. They will look at that row. And then if I say the findings in that table are different, then I know they're going to look at the others to see how they are different. And if you can find two things that you just, in a very short one or two sentences, can talk about that exciting content in your table, you will force them to read it. And it is absolutely true, because I've also found I wear lots of hats, but as an examiner, I do get that in some of the theses and dissertations I examine. They just say, table 2.1 shows whatever. And then you know what I do? I just pass over it and I go on. It's, I'm not drawn into it. But you may say, but I've got masses of data. And yes, I had a student who used data at information kiosks, transaction logs, in his table, it covered 
10,000 transactions of people going to these information kiosks and what they were looking for. And so the one, like let's say the rows were where these things were situated and the columns were the nature of the transaction. And so the numbers in that table are absolutely massive. So what did he do? It was his idea, not mine. He just picked on a couple of cells. I don't mean a whole row, I don't mean a whole column. It was one whopper of a, of a table. And then he highlighted the font there in blue. He either gave it a colored background or he did the font in a color. And that way you force the person in this great big thing not to look at a row or a column because even that's overwhelming. So what you do is he said, in the cell with blue font, the results are shown of what, what, what. And they are notable because of. And I think he chose two cells. I think he had a red one and a blue one and something. And by making you look at those, it had the same effect as in a smaller table of looking at a row or column. You get it. So that's really a long story, but it's, re it's very important just to force the reader to get into your table by helping them with a few things. So have a look at now bullet four. I'm going back to three afterwards. Write a section about it. That's what I've said now. Don't just jump over it. Table 2.1 presents. Okay, and then we move on. Write a section about it. Emphasize the main points. If you don't draw attention to what's in it, the reader might ignore it. Make them interested. Force them to read it. Now that's all about tables. I'm jumping up to the figure. A picture or diagram is worth a thousand words. If your work lends itself to photographs, go for it. Just remember it's against ethical principles to identify the people. So you do need to blur the faces. Be particularly careful if you are using children. That same student who I told you about got information kiosk data and had 10,000 or more transactions in his table. By transaction, I just simply mean a visit. You know, a visit to the site and looking at this. He also did a close-up study of children in school libraries. So for those children, he had to get permission. Now, it, unfortunately, in a rural area, it was not possible to ask the 10 children that he interviewed and observed. It wasn't possible to ask them all to go to their parents, bring them a form and bring it back. You know what kids are like. However, the library teacher was granted authorization to give permission. But there were also photographs and they were totally anonymized. So basically, if you said participant three, oh, by the way, never say just a participant. Give your participants names. Otherwise, it could all have come from one person, as I was once told in a review of an article. So you could say participant three complained that the font on the screen was too small. So you name them, but it's completely anonymous. And the library teacher signed permission for things that the pupils said to be used. Very important if you work with children, your authorization and ethical clearance is even more important. You'll have to explain in your ethical clearance application how you plan to anonymize the children. And then photographs were taken, but you've all seen photographs like that. The face just turned into a white egg. So there was no way that those pictures could be connected with any living person. But apart from that issue about a photograph, photographs are good. Diagrams are fantastic. You know, block diagrams where some diagrams overlap or the circles mean this and the squares mean that. Once again, I mentioned Prof Etienne. The research design that he himself synthesized from three others is very well done with blocks and ovals and the blocks are one color, the ovals are another. So there's two ways of distinguishing them. Just makes it so easy and so nice to understand. So your visualization is fantastic. If you can have some, do it. As far as label goes, the norm is that for a table, the label goes above, and for a figure, it goes underneath. So here is an example. If you are going to give a figure, this is a diagram, and this, by the way, is not a diagram of findings. This comes from a fabulous textbook by Saunders, and this is called Saunders Onion. Have any of you ever heard of Saunders Onion? No, you have. Some, who has? Put your hand up if you have heard of it. Seem to have one or two. 
this book you probably haven't been given because it comes from economic and management sciences. But in the list of good books I'm going to give you, I've got one called Research Methods in Education by Cohen, Mannion and Morrison. It's huge. I sometimes bring them to workshops, but I think today I didn't have the guts to carry them all along. And even though the heading is research methods in education, forget the last two words, about 10% of it is contextualised to education. The rest is just fabulous on, con on validity, participants, research designs. Oh, it's, it's absolutely marvellous. It's about 500 pages. But, so you don't read it. You just go to the index at the back and start looking up keywords that will, sh that will take you to what you want to find. Then there's a similar one for business management, and that is the Saunders one. Research methods for what business and economic sciences or business management, something like that. Here again, you forget those other words in the title. Just look at research methods. It is also absolutely fantastic. And that's where Saunders Onion comes from. So when you give a figure, you start by referring to it. You say Saunders Research Onion is depicted in figure three. Don't say, by the way, below or above, because you never know with final print. Something might go over the page. If you say figure 3.1, it's obvious. If they can't see it on that page, they'll turn over. Then, number two, you give the figure or table. And then number three, you explain it. The six layers respectively represent. If I was talking to you about research design, then I would talk a lot about this. Right now, it's not there for research design. It's absolutely fantastic, as is Creswell's triangle, super for research design, but we're not talking about research design today. I'm just giving you the pattern. Introduce it by giving its reference, give it, and then explain it. The six layers respectively represent, and there you'd probably go in for a paragraph, even half a page. So that's the way to do it. Likewise with a table. You know, introduce it, give it, and then discuss it underneath, and that's where you might want to draw people. If it's a small table, you don't have to. But if it's a big table, you might want to draw your reader's attention to a row or a column or a cell. Okay, literature, I'm not going to say much about this because you're getting it next week. But what I do say in the first bullet is integrate your sources. You know, we all want to avoid plagiarism, and we really don't intend to do it. But sometimes it happens by mistake. So if you actually take three sources all talking about the same topic and you read them and you think about them and then you perhaps put it in one paragraph with three references at the back automatically by combining and synthesizing. Synthesizing means I made it myself. If you write it that way you are very unlikely to commit plagiarism. So it's a good way of doing it and really it is so boring if you just have a list of Scott says, Naidu points out, you know just try to be adventurous and pull it together in themes. Yeah, one style is of course to put the reference at the end. Another one is to actually <coughs> put it at the front like Naidu points out and then when you put it at the end it might just be one person or if you've integrated your sources as I said in number two you could actually combine the names of the author. Combine those references at the end. Yeah, and the third one is exactly what I said just now. Avoid a whole lot of paragraphs, each devoted to the work of a certain author. That's not what we want. That is called an annotated bibliography. You sort of just take a book and you briefly write a paragraph about it, a journal article, you write a paragraph about it. When it comes to writing a dissertation, you are now on your way to being a true scholar. And therefore, we would much rather that you pull themes together and discuss them. Don't just have one paragraph for every source you are citing. But, you see, nevertheless, however, <laughs> all those useful words, there are places where it's very important to devote a paragraph to one person. And that is when you're using that person's work as a precedent for your study. You want to say what they did and how you will do it differently, or you are using their conceptual model. Earlier on, I spoke about Davis and the TAM, Technology Acceptance Model. And maybe a lot of people take Davis. Oh, there's so many. And then they do it in computing, they do it in engineering, they do it in the business sciences. And then what you do is you 
are talking about this as the conceptual model for your study and therefore you are welcome in your literature study to devote quite a section maybe more than a page to it but that is the foundation of your work you're working within the confines of that model you are perfectly entitled to write a big section on it but then just to remind you what I said late, early, uh, earlier about consistency and continuity. Do remember as you work, when you use that thing, just to refer to it, so that at least you make your use of it explicit. Don't have a research design chapter which makes all sorts of promises, and then a practical section which shows all your data without showing how your research design or conceptual model got used. Very important, as I mentioned briefly in the first run over the top level design um, PowerPoint, refer to related work. This is where journal articles come in. Other people who did something similar but in a different context or in a different way. And this plays a huge role in the gap identification and motivation for your work because they did it from this perspective or they did it on that sample. And now you're going to do it in a different way. In a literature study, it's not really a good idea to give your opinion because that's actually discussion. But sometimes as you're doing the literature chapter, you get such an urge that this is so relevant to my work. So this is just my suggestion. I haven't come across other people who do it. But I've said to my students, you know, when you get to the end of that chapter, that really spoke to you. You saw you could use it as a foundation. And that is so interesting because it's slightly different. It's done in a diff from a different perspective. So then I've said to them, why don't you, at the end of your literature study chapter, have a heading called application to this work. And then you can perhaps pick out the things that really spoke to you. Otherwise, you can also sort of build them into your research design chapter, but I think it's a good place to do it there, to talk about the ones that were extremely meaningful to you. And then, as I say, when applying literature to your own research is very important when you customize a model to your work. And in that case, you might mean you will probably definitely mention it in the research design and methods because it becomes your model but you will deal with it in the literature study where you first encountered it but when you adapt it to your own work when you actually not when you're talking about it in a section that says this is very relevant to me but when you come to the research design you're going to show how you actually did it you see and that's what I was also saying earlier that sometimes the literature forms the foundation to your work. In other words, the secondary data becomes your primary data. Like somebody I mentioned who did a study on water supply in municipalities throughout South Africa. All of that was secondary data because he got data from different municipalities. But I must tell you, it sounds so easy, doesn't it, to use secondary data. Oh, you say to somebody, you're using all secondary data. I'm working so hard collecting my data. And all you are doing is looking at policies and procedures on the use of IT in, in, in township clinics. You know, that is so easy. But I'll tell you, it's not. Because it means going into secondary, into literature, which is not your secondary data, it becomes your primary data, but it's different everywhere. So you will go perhaps to a clinic in Mamalodi and you will ask to see the annual report. And it will be written maybe by a doctor or a manager or some in the Department of Health and it will be written in this way. But I guarantee you, you go to a clinic somewhere else and they will have lots of stats and tables. I know about this from my brother because he runs a charity in the Cape Province which has a clinic. And he says writing the annual report is a mission because the donors want it from one viewpoint, the medical people want it from another, these people want it from an audit. So don't just think it's that easy. I'm going to use secondary data from policies and reports. 
because they're all different. And that is what the student found who did water supply in certain municipalities that had water shortages. He said every single report or set of tables he found presented the data in a completely different way. So it was up to him to kind of make his own tables with headings and he would acknowledge the source and so show what he got there. And then that secondary data, he would present it in a homogeneous fashion. But that is a case where secondary data becomes primary data because you are not interviewing people, you are not observing people, and you're not doing a survey. I am sad to say that in the, since I retired I've given a lot of workshops and I have found that more and more people are using the secondary data in the form of policies, white papers, acts, annual reports, and not actually getting the data from people. So at one workshop I said, you know, this is very interesting. There are 15 of you here and only three of you are actually collecting your own data. Tell me why this is. They said, you see, there have been so many problems with ethical clearance. And you understand that. We've already talked about ethical clearance. And so they find that when they use this, they, it's much easier to get ethical clearance. Well, that's sad, but it is the way it is. I'm just mentioning it because you may find yourself collecting empirical data or not doing so. I know your topics are not fin finalised. I know that you're going to be given six themes, right? And you're each going to choose themes that you want to work with. But just as a matter of interest, if you would just love to collect your own data with observation surveys, would you like to put up your hand and tell me? I'd like to know who would like, to, don't worry about ethical clearance, would you like to collect your own data? Don't be shy, put up your hands. <laughs> Come on, I know that lots of... <laughs> Well, now that's actually very interesting. The rest of you, would you rather use policies, procedures, databases? Put your hands up if that's what you would rather do. Yeah, very interesting, but exactly in line with my findings. All right, so that was actually a very interesting finding because I guarantee if I'd asked that question five years ago, 80% of you would have wanted to do a survey or an interview, or observation. There was somebody, one of these, who had a very interesting observation in supermarkets, and they would watch certain people, and then they would talk to them as they went out. But, you know, I mean, I guess ethically, that's very really dicey territory. And tell me your reason for wanting to use policies, procedures, reports. Is it because of ethical clearance? Can I have two? Re yeah, I, I'm, I fully support what you're saying, but I, I want you to add to my knowledge base. What would be a good reason for using existing stuff rather than collecting empirical data? Okay, put up your hand if you'd like to talk, and then I'll know who's going. Who wants to tell me? Come on. You're such good listeners. I want you to be good talkers. <laughs> give me a good, please give me two reasons. Okay. Yes. I'd like to make a remark. Um, I'm also retired, by the way. But uh, I did my studies in Groningen, in Netherlands. And um, the ethical clearance, I'm talking now as a, as a TUT, because I've been for 25 years at uh, TUT. To get my ethical clearance through TUT was a, an enormous task. And I'm not trying to disappoint you. What I'm trying to say is, be very careful here. It is a lengthy process. And I think you must work closely, that would be my advice, with your supervisors and also Dr. Etting. To see, I think the dean has also got a lot of experience with this, to, to get your ethical clearance. But it is, uh, for me personally, it was also a huge thing to get the ethical clearance from TUT. And was that for empirical research? Well, I only used the, the uh, results of the students, yes, mm, yeah. results of the students. While in the Netherlands, yes, they are extremely worried if you are um, using people, using animals, then of course you must have your ducks in a row. But using the data 
of the performance of students at TUT or at OIG. Yeah, because it comes out of reports. It comes out of the reports, reports and tables. Yeah. yeah. Exactly as you said right at the beginning, you, you do need that text, you know, to say, yes, you did it, you did it. Um, but unfortunately, I think TUT, the ethical clearance is quite, and I'm saying this in a, preceded in a positive way, that you see how you can get over this hurdle. Uh, it, for me, it was a huge hurdle. Sorry, I, I just want to I'm so, yes. context. Uh, it might be a good thing. I think one of the TUT ethical clearance or ethical processes is one of the best of the universities in South Africa. That's according to me. But it might be sometimes a bit overboard. Mm. I think it's a long time. It, when I was, look, I le retired from UNISA seven years ago. I think the last time I put through an ethical clearance application would have been for some hands-on research that I did during my two projects in my R&D year of 2010, yeah. which is sabbatical to other universities. And that really wasn't bad. But I know now it can take up to six months and people often say the proposal takes a year. So this is, I mean, we're off the subject, but I really do think it's a very important discussion because quite honestly in my day people, I think a lab experiment is all right, but remember people also do experiments with people. You know, you teach one lot with this computer programming technique, like I had somebody who used the visual environment Alice on some students and the class-based teaching with others and then compared the results. Now that today would probably be, that's maybe eight, no, oh, she graduated 2014, but she started like 2009. That might be quite risky today. So, um, um, but what else? so that's the way it is, and ethical clearance seems to be the reason. Because we went for observation, experiments that could involve people, surveys, interviews, and you get such rich data. So um, I would, don't be shy this time, I would like three people to tell me, let me give one, annual report. Something else from which you would collect data. Just three. Three people are not shy to give me one word. I think it's probably, maybe it's a tough question because you're not doing your research yet. But I will list some of the things and I'm going to ask Prof Taste to add some more. Okay, I'm going to say annual report, national databases, policies, of a, I don't mean government policy, I mean the policies and procedures of a certain business. What would you like to add to that? Yeah. Asking me. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I don't want to interfere too much, you know, but uh, I'm so tempted because I also have students like these ones and, and I also went through this whole process. It is tiresome. Um, Alternatives uh, to are, empirical. Sorry, those are the softer options. Um, but I didn't really hear what you were asking. I said annual reports, yeah. the policies, and we could, could be government policies, but it could also be the policies of an institution like TUT, yeah. yeah. but, but databases. The of that would be start with your ethical clearance as soon as possible, together with your supervisor, of course, uh, because it is a le lengthy process. And you don't want to, because if, if you start doing it in six months' time, then you're going to be hold up for another six months or some time. Start with it very, very early. Well, as soon as you've got your topic. Because they haven't, if I understand correctly, you're having lectures on various themes, is that right? Mm -hmm. And then you will choose where you want to do your work. So that the dissertations are not all over the place, they're consolidated in six well, sections. So the moment when you put your study in place, you know mm -hmm. what you, are you going to do interviews, your methodology? Mm -hmm. As soon as you put your clarified your methodology with your supervisor, uh, address them, the, uh, the, the, the ethical clearance issue around that. that would be but it will be easier if you're not using human subjects. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's what I want to ask. Uh, maybe you could help us with a brief clarification of um, cases where you need the ethical clearance and cases where you don't. Everything. Everything. Absolutely <coughs> no exceptions. Even if you are locked up 
in your own laboratory working with batteries and fuel and pieces of metal and welding and high-tech laser cutters you need ethical and you are making a building a prototype that needs ethical clearance doesn't it i'm going to stop now <laughs> i think what some of them are easier than others yes yeah. yes uh, and, and and i think that is uh, what prof was trying to say is let's look at the easier ones there are difficult ones where the people and animals and those kind of things involved Luckily, I don't think it's really in your environment. I don't think we work with animals, do we? But if he wants to, like the, the example that he had about drunken drivers, for example, that is going to be a difficult. It's dicey, yes. Okay, fine. Um. I actually just wanted to add on the example that you had given. One example where it would be really hard to get ethical clearance is when you want to work with sus subscriber data when you're working on maybe building a recommender system in telecommunication networks. You'll need inputs for your recommender system, like your call data records. Which Absolutely. Who calls who, how they call, their behavior, yes. who they call, and all of that. And Getting that clearance. Um, yeah, you see, what you would probably be able to get is like the month in statistics. You know, the durations of the calls and whether they related to domestic, domestic prob you know, small intranets or whether they were national communications. You'll probably get all that. But attitudes, behavior, yeah. is that what you like to do? Mm. And yet, you know, what, what do we say? We say, in our work, we say, when we ask people to sign informed consent, we tell them their data will be anonymous, absolutely confidential, used for academic purposes only. So there should not be, unless it's a very small group, there should be no way that it can be linked to living persons. But nonetheless, it's just getting, it's getting so sensitive, it's more and more difficult, and it's tough at UNISA as well. <laughs> Go for it, you add value. Another thing which I also experience, don't come up with your own questionnaire. <laughs> Am I right, Prof? You looked up. Usually a standardized one. Yeah, but it's a standardized one because it was developed and it's validated and uh, it's, you will get easier uh, clearance for an uh, existing uh, uh, questionnaire than developing your own. Now, well, I'd like to add to that that if you are doing a questionnaire on a subject for which there doesn't exist one, you know, you're doing some pioneering work. But then what I suggest is there are two ways to validate it. And the one is to get your questions from the literature. Read all that there is about that and say, OK, that, that happened. So you turn it into a question. And the second thing, so number one, you validate the content. It's from the literature. Number two, you pilot test it. And after the pilot test, you change your questionnaire, you remove duplicates, you rephrase, you get rid of questions that are hard to understand, and you might even change your method of delivery. But I think that those two give you the best validity you can get if there is no existing questionnaire. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know. Here we are having ethical clearance and having a very interesting discussion. And I need to get back to the literature review, which will be done next week. And so if you look at the middle bullet there, I said, you might like to conclude a section just by pulling together the main points. OK, so, you know, you've got your themes. And then the last sentence in, say, section 2.5 is just pulling those points together. You may, as I say, do a table. Somehow it was tables that got us onto this. I said that the table can be very useful, but you must refer to the table. And sometimes you even repeat that table in your data section because you actually put it there with the themes and you add a new column in which you show what you found in your work. And that can really be exciting. So you put a sort of generic table in the literature section and then you use it when you present your findings just to put in the last column how you found what, what in your work related to that particular theme. 
So in other words, you're making it practical. Okay, I've already, we've already said this, but there are purely conceptual studies. One is meta-analysis of journal articles. That I don't think would go down for a dissertation, not even a PhD thesis. It's the kind of things that very clever academics like to use. They will take like a classic information systems journal, management information quarterly or something, MIS quarterly, and then they will look at it over the last 10 years along with another parallel journal, say so one, maybe one American, one British, and they will look at what Art, what themes the articles represented. So now you can see that's not really for a dissertation or a thesis, you've got to find your own stuff. But that is, a, that is called meta-analysis. And it will speak about in the last five years, in the top five journals, what are the themes that have been addressed. Then there's a conceptual study, and I've spoken about this already in context, something that you design your own model or framework. A lot of, I worked on e-learning, and I, people who wanted to work with e-learning and educational technology came to me, and a number of them actually developed evaluation frameworks. Prof. Etienne is one, evaluation for framework for virtual technology training. Somebody else did an evaluation framework for m-learning environments. Somebody else an evaluation framework for MCQ systems. And so if you want to do something like that, you will start with a conceptual study in which you draw from the literature and design something. But I would say, if you don't actually test your framework empirically, you've missed the big point. In the second case above, that is with those frameworks, it might be the start of a newly synthesized framework or model which you develop further. Or maybe you develop it and then, they, and then your master's degree students, when you're a prof with your doctorate and your professorship and you've got students yourself, then they might want to take your framework and test it in different contexts. Okay, different ways on referencing. And uh, you'll have the screen, and I think if you're having a full talk next week on a literature study, I think it would not be relevant for me to mention this. I'm sure he will deal with it. And perhaps the only one that I will mention is the bottom one. When you give a direct quote, you must give the page number. Because at that point, it's a sort of plagiarism, and it's legal plagiarism. You must put quote marks around it, look at that, look at that last sentence. Second line from the bottom, open quote, in such situations the only acceptable sampling technique is random sampling, close the quote mark, fray 213, page 12. We used to have colon and then the page numbers. These days it's more common to have P dot. When it's a quote, give the page number. For a PhD, you could only cite original sources. For a master's degree, some amount of second line secondary referencing is okay. So, for example, a study in 2008 found the following, and that was Hollow 2008, but you never found that article. You weren't able to get it, but it was cited by Klein 2012 four years later. So you knew about Hollard's work, not because you read it, but because Klein spoke about it. So you only put Klein in your reference list and you put it there and then you have secondary referencing. In other words, somebody else's work as cited by this person, etc., etc., and then the this person goes in your references. When you cite something immediately after, you don't have to give the date. For example, have a look at that in the middle. Line, end of line two, bullet two. It has been shown that the food firm and fit causes a mean weight increase of 15% in female pigs and 10% in males. And that was found by Neverenden and Gooney. The next sentence, I don't want to put Neverenden and Gooney 2009 six words after I've done it. So there I said, furthermore, Neverend and Nguni found that the skin of the pigs grew darker and thicker. So that's just a useful little tip. It's not wrong, there's no marks given or attached to it. It's just that you don't want to end your sentence with like Smith 
2018. And then the very next sentence is Smith in brackets 2018. You can just say Smith when it is so close. But if it's in another paragraph, you will put the date. Can you speak a bit louder? I'm saying I came across an article once when I was doing the proposal. But the English there was very bad. So I asked myself, can you reference bad English? How do you work about that? And you find that the information that is there is very useful. Yes. But uh, the word construction... Ah. I know exactly what you mean because I was once writing something about my own work and you know these days it's very easy to access who cited you and I found people like from Asia who said very good stuff but their English was absolutely dreadful and so if I wanted to quote then I didn't feel so bad about it in other places I actually wrote it better you know, let's suppose that this Asian guy, his name was Kayami, and then I will say, in citing my work, Kayami pointed out da da da. And then, so then I'm not using his words, but that's what he was doing. He was pointing out the value of something, and I wrote that. Because if, but if I'd done a direct quote, it would have been fine to use his bad language. Somebody once said to me, when I do, a direct quote of something from America on, at, uh, um, on an attitude study. Can I say behavior with ending with V-I-O-R? And I said, yes, you can. If it's in quotes, it's fine. But if you're saying that, that um, this American, what will, ah, oh, an American, I've got a good name, Trump. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Inciting my work, Trump uh, Trump, oh no, Trump pointed out that behavior, Trump pointed out that his own behavior is not always perfect. <laughs> 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 okay, so you get the idea that if you are writing about it, fix the English and the spelling. But if you are citing it, put it in quote marks and that's the, that's the way it is. Because yes, indeed, you do want to use it because it's very relevant. Does that help? Yes. So, so does it mean that good English is not very Yeah, but you see his, ac no, but his, his um, academic stature and his scholarship was great. Mm -hmm. You can't hold it against him that he was Chinese or Indonesian. Yeah. Yeah. No, you can, I mean, as long as you can understand what he says. If it's so bad that you can't understand it, I would be very scared of mentioning it because it might be misinterpretation. But if you know this is what he meant, then say it, but not in quote marks. Say that he pointed out that, or he noted that. But if you want to be absolutely safe, you could put it in quotes. And then there's a little word, S-I-C, sick. It's not about being sick like coronavirus. It's a Latin word and it means as is. So quite honestly what you could do is you could end the quotes and then put in brackets S-I-C and then that shows it's taken directly from that source. So there definitely are ways of handling it. I'm not going to say anything more about the referencing because I'm sure you will. Make sure you ask about that in the literature one. Now here is a very important point about academic writing. Your literature must be current. If you spend three to four years on your master's degree, then when you take it all to your supervisor with a big smile and say, here's my draft beginning to end, or, or you tell the supervisor, I will soon be bringing you my final draft of beginning to end, this is one of the first things the supervisor will say is, please update your literature. Because it's now 2020. And the most recent reference in this is 2016. <laughs> Not good enough. So you have to go back to the new literature. You don't rewrite it. But just please find some more sources from 2017, 18 and 19 and add them in. So you've got to keep it current. If it's a journal article, it's better if it's from the last six to eight years. If it's a textbook, it can indeed go back further. And there are times when you really want to refer to something. Like I told you that 
I was initially in HCI and that led me into e-learning and educational technology because that's got an awful lot to do with human-computer interaction. And there was a man called Nielsen who, around about 1993, produced what was called Nielsen's Heuristics. Have you come across that, those of you doing informatics? Maybe, maybe not. And he started this whole thing of criteria to evaluate usability. But now that's 1993. If somebody examining my dissertation is not an HCI expert, they'll think, what on earth is this female doing, quoting a source of 1993? So what do I do? I say, second bullet, when it is dated but important, you refer to it as a classic paper or seminal work to indicate its relevance and role. It depends on the discipline and topic. Obviously, if you're a historian, most of your work is going to come from the year dot. But for those of us in computing, it's a fast-moving discipline. We need to be current. But when you go back to pioneering work that founded a certain section of the discipline, refer to it as classic paper or seminal work. Another thing is don't discard your sources. Remember that the examiners may come back to you and say, please expand the section on whatever. So you need your sources. Some might be paper-based because you took a book out of the library. Then please photocopy the relevant pages. And, of course, if it's electronic on your computer, make sure there's a backup so that when you move on to the next computer, you don't lose all this. Keep all of your sources. The, uh, the rule of thumb is that you keep sources for five years after work was done. But come on, with an academic, when is our work done? You finish your dissertation, you write a journal article or a conference paper. Somebody contacts you and asks you a question. This happened to me a couple of years ago. Somebody wrote and asked me something about a journal. Could I give them more information? Yo, what a hunt. I had to find the source. But most, I, do, I am quite good at keeping stuff. So I've got this pile of paper-based files and masses of things on my laptop. And so if you get, if you write a journal article and the reviewer of the journal article says elaborate, you need your source, or somebody who reads your work, and this is very exciting. Somebody mailed me from Columbia, asked about my work and said, may I use your research instrument? So it's very important to keep your sources on hand, not for five years, because it's five years after what? Sure, maybe it's five years after your graduation day, but it's not five days after your, mo your most recent article, which still had something from your dissertation contributing, and then the reviewer or a reader asks you a question. So hang on to your sources. You might need to refer back, even years later, and photocopy from a photocopy from a library book or a book you borrowed. Yes, sir. Um, just to add on the previous slide, uh, it's the best way to do all the work would be using a reference version software. Like Mendeley. Like Zotero as well. Mm. Yeah, Mendeley is absolutely amazing because I haven't put myself onto Mendeley. You know, I, I've, I still, like, I've, I'm having, a, I've got a conference paper accepted this year overseas. I don't know actually now whether I want to travel or not. I think we've got to see what coronavirus does. But I'm not a, a wildly active researcher anymore, and so I've just decided it's not worthwhile for me to get into Mendeley. But the people who have said it's just totally amazing. Have you heard of Mendeley? Yes. Mm. Sorry, I have to. I mean, yeah, PDG data devices for internet. Now I've used internet. But start yesterday already with internet. I don't know, Prof, you also might have started with I've used internet, I've yes. I've used a card system. <laughs> we had cards <laughs> in a box. Um, Punch cards. Yeah, when I did my uh, masters. Um, and you lose one citation. You have to take it out of your dissertation. But um, I've used EndNote and we have to have a license. You have a student who have access to it. But it's, uh, it, it's really, really, I don't know the one that you mentioned because I just do. Mendeley is hot off, 
like five years old. It's really the, it seems to be the thing of the future, but I'm certainly not going to get myself into it. But the license, if it's free, as you said, yeah. No, I don't think Mendeley is free, but UNISA has a license. Okay, but Mendeley, you do have. And I think it would also be a very good thing to ask Dr. Etienne from the library that he's doing her presentation on Mendeley. It is brilliant. You need it. You need it yesterday already. Okay. Sorry. I am yeah. so to I know you're absolutely right because the thing is that EndNote does a does the storage for you. Exactly. Anything. It's it so amazing. Any article that you have, any book, because I think nowadays, especially in the ICT, articles is, is much more relevant, in my opinion, than, than literature, you know, books. Books are dying, but books are way. And once you get it, Look, you'll, you, you will use books a lot in your research design chapter to qualify the kind of methods you're using. You also need to show, touch briefly on other research designs and explain why you didn't use them. But for the rest of it, I, journal articles for the last six years are good. Maybe back as far as ten if it's highly relevant. Um, very easy for numbers. For 1 to 20, write it in words. Some people say oh, only up to 10. So then, uh, if I'm using my system up to 20, I will write 15. I will spell it out. After that, you can use the number. As I already said earlier, don't start a sentence with a number. But there are places where you want to. You see these buts and howevers, they're popping up all the time. And that's when you come to percentages. Let's say you want, to give the find you want to give the findings of some data you collected. And you want to say that 15% of the people did that, and 50% that, and the other percent that. And you really want to say 15%. But you want to start the sentence with it. So this is how you do it. Look at that. Where I give that first one, three lines up, got it? 12% in brackets 12% of the participants flew only on budget airlines while 50% mainly used national carriers and 30% used whatever, I guess whatever was cheaper. Now why, but you might say, but why did I bother with that 12%? Now you've told us use a word, sure. 12%. Why? Because we are very visual and we want to compare. So the fact that that figure is so much lower, 12%, I want to see it as 12% so that it talks to the 56% and the 32%. So that's how I start a sentence with a number. I write it in words, but because I need the number for comparison, I put the number in brackets. Now, of course, I'm very sad to find that there's not much empirical studies, not many surveys, not observations and interviews, but when you do one day do something like that, don't talk about subjects. That was used a lot. I'm sure, Tais, <laughs> you came across subjects. But it's now considered rather rude, so we call them participants because they are taking part in our study. Or if they answer the questionnaire, we call them respondents. Gender, we used to have everything as he and him. Now we don't do that. We either take line five, S slash he, he or she, or her or him. But another alternative, and this is my preference, is always to write about them in the, f in the plural. So I talk about participants, and then I can say they did this in their studies, that type of thing. Then you don't have to worry about this he, she stuff. But if you really do want to say he or him, and I had a very conservative student once who told me right out, I'm not going to say he, she, I'm going to say he, him, but right at the beginning in chapter one, in the place where I give my assumptions and my scope, I will say that the author is using the male gender, making reference to he or him. This, however, refers to participants of all genders. Okay, you need never be at a loss again. I did mention to you, I'm going to give you a little piece of paper. It's a two-page document. You will get it when you get the slides. And it's got a lot of nice words in it. Now, I wrote this thing initially for my own benefit. 
about 20 years ago and kept on adding whenever I heard a nice word or read a nice word. But of course, really the thesauruses we have now, and probably did have it 20 years ago, but I just like to do it my way. A thesaurus is brilliant. I just love to highlight a word in a document and then open the thesaurus and it takes this word and it gives me about six or seven alternatives oh, and some of them are so nice and, and you know what I've said to you, I like our writing to be lacquer and so I can use a really nice word like for example um, assert, affirm, these are words we don't use often and I learned them from a thesaurus but what you will find in my little word document that it was not just synonyms is I also gave a couple of expressions like where I put a few words together and so I hope that it helps you but as I say use the awesome online thesaurus but from my thing you might like to look at the terms and the phrases. Okay the happy day comes you are going to submit your proposal, first draft, or a chapter to the supervisor, or maybe you are supervising. You see how I'm writing a journal? You see how I'm bringing journals into this? Because I want you to think holistically. From proposal to dissertation, maybe during dissertation, conference paper, afterwards, journal article, or even during. Certainly with a PhD, you should do at least one journal article while you're writing it. So I'm talking to you about all of this. So we when you send your draft of an article to the co-author, there's that sense of relief. Whew. All those late nights. And you know, you just can't wait to hit send. It's his problem. It's five minutes to midnight, I, or maybe it's five minutes to 2 a.m. and you hit send and you say, what's on TV? I've missed it. all the serials. What's a new one? Where's my fishing rod? We're still. Where's the baby? <laughs> <gasps> or if you're a very serious-minded academic or person in business, <sighs> now I can catch up at office. Or otherwise, the person you live with said, there's no food in the house. <laughs> and you want to say, well, so what? Why didn't you do something about it? But they don't. One of my colleagues flew back from overseas conferences, a high-level academic, her husband met her at the airport and said to her, there's no food in the house. <laughs> so, I don't know how he and the son got on. They probably ate everything that was there and lived off takeaways. But nonetheless, that's some light relief. The fact of the matter is we can't wait just to have a break and get on with our own life, even if it's only for a week. But... I've always I said to you, every day is be nice to supervisors day. It's not fair on your supervisor to give them something full of slips and errors. For goodness sake, proofread it. Sure, when you're at five minutes to midnight and you're half dead, then go to sleep. If you, don't, if you want to, take two or three days and then sit down and read it with a nice cup of coffee or a Coke or whatever. You'll actually be astonished how many slips you find, how many things that are so easy to fix. Now, of course, it won't be perfect, and there's going to be definitely academic issues that your supervisor needs to address. But fix it as much as you can, please. Do you agree with me, Tais? How do you feel when you get given a chapter and it's just, you know, you've got as far as page three, and you've found ten language slips? And I don't mean details clever stuff, I mean silly things. Can I add on to that note something that helped me? Sorry, I'm, I'm so rude. No, it's I not. It's, it, don't you think it's, it's fabulous? I, I, I'm, I walk around with this in my mind because I'm not a fluent writer um, as, as Prof is. I, I find it difficult to write and I walk around with it in my mind. And then my supervisor said one day to me, if you don't write something for me, I don't know what you want to say. And, and it might be in contradiction with what you were saying here, but uh, in the first stage, in the beginning stages, write it down and give it to your supervisor, because he does not know what you are thinking if you don't write it down for him. It make yeah, sense. Um, I remember particularly with my PhD, when I was synthesizing a lot of stuff for each chapter, I said to myself, 
write it badly first because it was more important to plug the content in. But where I would differ from you is I wouldn't have taken that to my supervisor because it was so bad. No, and no. it doesn't matter if it's not I your I home language. <laughs> I mean, just to get it there on the paper. Um, yes, I fully agree. Don't send rubbish. But I mean, your progress also. <laughs> What's your progress? In the beginning, I think the supervisor will admit it. But you must also show progress in your writing so that your, your baby steps in the beginning should not be baby steps throughout your whole writing. If I can yeah. say that, True, because at the end, I'm my weakest ever writer, when it came to his last chapter, which was at the end of a quite a long journey, I just thought, wow, do you know what? He got a distinction. I think it might be because he used language very simply. There were no errors, but it wasn't, he didn't even try to be fancy. But yes, so um, I once said in a workshop exactly what you said. I said, write it badly first. Up came a hand and this person said, how can you say that? You must go over every sentence until it's perfect. So I said, well, it's a personal style. I prefer at the beginning, just get, it's, it's on these pages, it's here. Get it onto paper, but that is for me. That's not for my supervisor. And I just do, I know there will still be errors, but I get rid of all the obvious errors that will make the supervisor cross. Yeah. Yeah, I fully agree. I, I'm not contradicting what you're saying, but and I found it for myself. There, there, there was five, six weeks that I don't com communicate, and then I'm too afraid to say something to my supervisor, send it to him or her. No, uh, you, you must. Yeah, you I'm must write something every day. Yeah. You must write. But then just check it yourself to make sure that when you deleted, you didn't delete too much or that you didn't by copy and paste wrong. And this happened with something I wrote this week. The same sentence appeared twice. For goodness sake, get rid of those obvious slips. So then what I said is this. It isn't the supervisor's role to fix major language errors or to do consistency checking. Like you take a certain topic and you call it this here and on the next page you call it that. You need to say that these terms are used interchangeably. Just talk about things. So reread it and check it before sending. But I do not say, I mean, goodness, the supervisor's paid to do their job. But just try to get it tidy. So I started this one by read that one. Reread and check it. You also start assessing your own content because when you reread it, you'll actually realize that there's a gap or that you've overdone some topic. You know, don't you think so? You actually start assessing your content as well as your language. Ooh, why didn't I deal with that? And oh my goodness me, what a boring paragraph. You've gone on and on and on, for goodness sake. Make it one sentence, Ruth, that sort of thing. These things, okay. Um, you can, when you reach the end of your work, make arrangements with a critical reader. Sometimes students will have a buddy system. I'll read your chapter, you read mine. But because I do want to tell you that if your supervisor if identifies too many obvious errors, now look at the kind of errors I'm talking about, technical. You know, like this point has got a bullet, the next point is over there without a bullet. Duplicated content, oof, that happens all the time. Spelling mistakes, sentences you can't possibly understand because you changed it and in the process it lost its meaning. That's the kind of error I'm talking about. When your supervisor finds those, they might give it back to you and say, look, please just make this a little bit more readable and give it back to me. And then you've actually lost two weeks. So try to get rid of the basic errors. But, now, this is exactly fitting in with what you say, last bullet. When the draft does not have too many mistakes, supervisors will frequently advise on language improvements. I did it all the time. My last student graduated in November last year, so I'm not supervising anymore. But my students will tell you that I fixed so many of their language errors for me. But I didn't want to fix stupid mistakes, but I helped them all the time to write it better because I could see what an effort they'd put in. And so I was more than happy to advise on language improvements. And then 
that makes it easier for them to assess content in the next round. Because I want to say exactly what Prof Tay says, that their writing got better. And by me, by me helping them and showing them the principles, their writing got better and better. And it made it easier for all of us the next time. So this correction thing has got a dual purpose. You do the obvious stuff, and then give it to your supervisor. Unfortunately, there are some supervisors who won't touch language errors. They say, send it to the editor at the end. I don't agree with that because I think it destroys the readability for the supervisor, but it's a matter of opinion. I believe that the supervisor should give some. It's lovely if a supervisor gives basic language help. Okay, and if they give them, if they do send it back to you and give you advice, then it is a bonus. You can write it better the next time, but it does slow down your process. So the better it is when you give it to them, the better. Ask a family member, a friend, there are so many people who can be good critical readers. So yeah, you reread it a few days after completing it to eliminate the obvious errors. Please check technical issues, such as section numbering. We don't want to see section 3.2.1, and the next section is section 3.2.4. Or, here is figure 5.2, and four pages later, figure 5.2, right? It was time to change the number, that sort of thing. Take it on your own responsibility as an academic to get rid of those silly things. But much more important, the semantics, not the, tech, the technical stuff you must get as good as you can. But is there a logical flow? Is there an advanced organizer? I've called it a lead, service, a lead sentence. Americans call it an advanced organizer so that they know up front what they're going to get. Remember, I said you write a nice sentence at the beginning of a section so the reader knows what's coming. Or is there a point that makes a major point? What's more in the logical flow? Are there contradictions or inconsistencies? Sometimes the way we project things from the literature, we actually almost turn one around by mistake. Okay, now I know there are situations where one literature has a completely different approach to another, but you can have cases where you deal with a point and you actually misrepresent what an author says. And then the supervisor will say, but this is strange, I thought these people were in support of this. You go back to the article and you see, oh yes. You know, so ask yourself or ask somebody else, what do these sentences mean to you? Are any of these sentences like funny or confusing? If you don't have a person like that, then last set by bullet, pretend that you are somebody who reads it for the first time and will that person understand it. One of the ways of solving sort of jerky content that doesn't flow is just to ask yourself, wouldn't some of this stuff be better in another section? Because have I got similar issues in, other, in different places? Well, if so, combine them, so integrate them. Or is there some redundant material? If I actually, because I was so busy working with the literature that I basically wrote everything in this guy's paragraph. But quite honestly, those two sentences can be tossed. Are the connections between your sentences clear? Is it clear how you've led them up and built them on? Does it flow? Is there a golden thread? Is, is it clear what each section actually does? And then I also talked about terminology. I've said this before. Maybe you use different terms for the same thing. It happens all the time. Because in the literature, this person uses that term and that person uses that term. So why don't you write a sentence of explanation? Just say the concept, um, this concept is referred to as ABC by certain researchers and as DEF uh, by others. However, for the purposes of this document, the terms are used interchangeably. Self-plagiarism is something that comes up when you've written things before. Like when you have written a conference paper during your studies and now you want to deal with that part again in your study and you use the wording from the conference paper because that was so good, it was written with your supervisor and it's really beautifully written. So you go back to your original document and you put the wording that you used for the conference paper into it. But now, oh wow, what's going to happen now? The similarity index will show a huge overlap. Well, there's a way to handle that. 
the way to handle that, I think I have got it in another talk, in an article writing talk, you simply say that the content of sections 5.2 to 5.4 are similar to the content of a conference paper presented by the author and supervisor at such and such a conference. In other words, you've covered yourself. It won't, if it's a direct verbatim takeover, you could put the whole thing in a quote mark, but usually it isn't. But you just use it. So you actually say up front. The other thing you say up front, that this section is similar to that, and that that conference paper was written only for the purposes of this study and as part of this study. But what you can also do, and you should do it, brag book. When you submit your dissertation, maybe you've got a conference paper out of it. Maybe you're doing your doctorate and you've got two conference papers and a journal article, put in a plastic pocket right at the beginning and put them in it, or bind them as part of the books of the thesis with a cover page. Of course, I know now they're all electronic. So we're all going to have to kind of learn a different way of dealing with it. But in the old days, you would have a cover page and you would say, publications that have already emerged from this research. And then you would just put them in right at the beginning, which also very much it enhances your chances of passing because your publications had peer review. So the examiner sees, wow, peers have already accepted this, jolly good. So it, enchants, it enhances your chances of mistakes, but it also shows what you actually wrote. Um, I've talked about this already. The sequence is very important. Concepts must build up. But when you look at a sentence and you ask yourself, can it be improved? I've got a really good tip. Second point of bullet two, you can sometimes make a sentence flow much better just by turning it around. Because you see, to look at the bottom one, make the punch clear up front. Sometimes the most important thing is actually like the tail to a long sentence. If so, just turn your sentence around. Yeah, put important words near the beginning. Have a look at this. This is an exact example of what I said just now. Look at that bullet. Of central importance to risk management is developing effective strategy for creating whatever's. The improvement, what's really important is developing the structures. So the improvement is the development of effective structures for creating those things is vitally important. It's a much nicer sentence, isn't it? It's much stronger. Similarly, I'm going to take a drink of water while I do that. You read the next one. What I said in ordinary font about X and Y, and there is an improvement underneath in italics. sometimes say to me, when you lecture on academic writing, which I do because I'm asked to, because people want the academic writing to improve, they say, but surely this isn't my problem, it's all the editor's problem. But no, if you are going to be a scholar, we want you to be a good writer. It's absolutely true that if you really struggle the, you'll be astonished at what the editor can do with it. But if your writing is already quite good, it won't change that much. But one thing editors will not do is that they will fix all your errors. They will get it clean and perfect. But those sentences, there's nothing, they're not wrong. But it's just that by turning it around, I can put the punch first, I can make it easier to understand. And I remember somebody who said, I'm so disappointed, I thought the editor was going to change all my flow and give me nicer words, but no. So I actually contacted the editor and I said, the student has complained because they thought, that she knew that her writing said what it had to say, but it wasn't good. She thought you would make it better. And she said, no, I'm not really allowed to change the way they present their content. And so I will fix everything, but they probably wouldn't do changes like that. 
another example, two more examples, and I'm not going to go through those with you. I'd like you to do it yourself, and I want to tell you that this presentation will be so much more relevant when you are actually writing your proposal, but even more relevant when you are writing your dissertation. But anyway, we were talking about how you prepare for the big event of giving it to your supervisor or sending a journal article for review, and then it comes back. And it is heavily marked up. The track changes fill the side. Or if they prefer to use pen, the red ink is all over. And so it is disappointing, but it's not an insult. We as senior academics have it all the time if we submit journal articles. So don't, don't be offended. Don't cry. Don't say, I'm a failure. Oh, what does my supervisor think of me that I did it so bad? No. It's just part of positive criticism. So just make up your mind when you give a draft to your supervisor that when it comes back and there are lots of issues to be dealt with, that you're not going to have your feelings hurt. It's just the way it goes. So now use that feedback to improve the document. I will, however, but however, nevertheless, <laughs> there are times when the supervisor hasn't quite understood something and you know actually that what you said was right. It had to be there. It's your study, you know it best. Then you just have a polite discussion with the supervisor. I'm, so, I'm sorry, I realise I didn't make myself clear there, but I'm not going to take that out or I'm not going to change it the way you suggested it because it is accurate, it is appropriate. But what I realise is, and let's look, if you disagree, I'm in the middle of the screen, have an open discussion face to face if it's your supervisor or in writing with a journal article and I'm saying that because I have done it. I've written to journal articles and say I think that that criticism was not actually justified because wah wah wah. You see, you and me as the writer might well be correct but the way we expressed it lead to misunderstanding. So it's not what you did. It's how you communicated it. They misunderstand you. Yes, of course it's correct. And you know, I would say to students um, about this, and then she says, I remember one, her shoulders went up and she said, no, but I did do it like that. I did it and it's right. Okay. I know and I know what you did but the examiner won't. It's not what you did, it's just the way you expressed it. And it's so important that I repeat that sentence on the next slide. It's not what you did, it's just the way you communicated it. You opened your own work to misunderstanding. And so when they come back to you with a criticism, sometimes you're not going to change the meaning of it at all because you did it well and you are expressing it accurately but not clearly. So, to repeat then, you don't have to implement every suggestion or change suggested. Many of the problems can just be solved by making things clearer, by rephrasing or adding a reason or elaborating something. It's just a matter of saying it better. So, the underlying issue that a supervisor or reviewer is speaking about might not be the content. It might be the communication and the presentation just has to be changed. So, write it right. And that's it for a very long presentation. Thank you for being such good listeners.